we have another speaker dr La robert lorazo from maastricht netherlands he is available now for his uh, talk on recent insights in post cardiotomy ecmo dr lorazo is full professor of cardiac surgery and extracorporeal life support deputy director department of cardiothoracic surgery ECLS program director Maastricht University Netherlands he was also past chairman of Euro Elso welcome dr lorazo it's a pleasure to listen to you again so over hello, to you sir thank you thank you for the very kind uh, and appreciate the invitation thank you the, i would like to thank the society for the honor of presenting my data i will share my screen and uh, I will talk to you today about uh, an update uh, about the use of ECMO in post-cardiotomy shock uh, patients. These are my disclosure. So first of all, I would like to highlight uh, the peculiarities and the incidence about post-cardiotomy shock uh, and the use of ECMO in this setting. As you can see here, quite a busy figure, but I just to show how many comorbidities, how many risk factors, and how many complex situations uh, characterize the post-cardiotomy ECMO. Indeed, these patients have a lot of comorbidities. They come from a surgical operation, most of the time very long, prolonged surgery, prolonged extracorporeal circulation, so a high bleeding risk, and so forth. So, I, in my opinion, the post-cardiotomy ECMO patient is the most complicated, even more than a cardiac arrest patient. What is the incidence? This was an extensive review we performed uh, recently uh, in the preparation of an expert consensus paper I show you before, uh, afterwards. And the ranges, uh, uh, the ranges are from 0.4 to 3.7% of the cardiac surgery operation. But to have a more a broader evaluation, uh, I would like to use this uh, paper from Vala Bayosula and colleagues who look at the trends, predictors, and outcome of, uh, of uh, temporary mechanical sickle support in post-cardiotomy uh, shock. And they look at more than 130,000 uh, uh, 130, admission for post-cardiotomy shock. And you can see that half of these patients required mechanical security support. But what were the trends and the outcomes? You can see that the trends of post-cardiotomy shock is steadily increasing, whereas the use of mechanical security support remained the same along the years, which is quite, first of all, surprising, and I would say disappointing. What about the type of mechanical security support? Well, you can see that actually the trend is more towards a declining of use of mechanical support, mostly due to the reduced use of the intraortic balloon pump, the red line. Whereas the ECMO is uh, steadily increasing, so ECMO is more and more used in post-cardiotomy shock, whereas intraortic balloon pump is less, used less and less. We recently had the chance to look at the ESO registry for post-cardiotomy adult uh, patients. And this paper, uh, this uh, study's investigation was published in the critical care medicine last year. We had the chance to look at more than 7,000 patients with the mean age of uh, 56 years. And you can clearly see that the use of uh, ECMO in post-cardiotomy is remarkably increasing along the years. But what about the outcome? Unfortunately, and you can see from this uh, continuous line, although the ECMO use is steadily increasing, the survival, in-hospital survival, remains stable uh, between 50 and 60%, unfortunately. So not really satisfactory results. What about the predictors? This paper from Fuchs and colleagues from the Karolinska Hospital in Stockholm they show that if you implant the ECMO with lactate level higher than 10, 
in patients with ischemic heart disease made a big difference, as you can see here. But this was also shown in a, in a non-ischemic heart disease operation. Uh, although the patient had a better prognosis than ischemic heart disease patient, still lactate 10 threshold uh, really divided the two groups of patients with good or bad prognosis, as you can see here. Lee and colleagues instead look at not at the lactate threshold, but look at the lactate washout, and they could see that if the washout is quick, or let's say if you have a quicker lactate washout, your prognosis is certainly better. Another important issue that we highlight in our 10-year uh, experience we published in 2017 is about the postoperative bleeding post and you can see here, I arrived in Maastricht in 2015. We made a very, very aggressive uh, protocols to reduce bleeding. And you can see we were able slightly and constantly to reduce the bleeding rate in this patient, which were all, uh, even 100%. So all patients revised for bleeding after postcardiotomy. But now, in the most recent year, eras, we were able really to reduce quite uh, dramatically the bleeding rate postoperatively. And this translated in the much better in-hospital survival, as you can see, we almost reached 70%. This is my and colleagues from the Vienna group. They showed that in the more than 350 postcardiotomy patients, that if you interrupt, if you win the ECMO at seven days, then these patients have most favorable prognosis. So again, ECMO duration is very important in the pronostication of, uh, for the outcome. Another important issue is the age. You can see here, uh, we look at the ELSO registry and patient age is increasing in the ECMO uh, registry. You can see almost 15% of the patient now are older than 70. And of course, the outcome is not as favorable as in the younger patient, but still, in the RELSO registry, the ECMO uh, outcome was 30% as in hospital survival, which is, I think, still really acceptable. And uh, this was uh, recently confirmed by Biancari and colleagues, again, in postcardiotomy ECMO, and they look at patients older than 70 and younger, as we did, and they confirmed the same thing. So they confirmed, obviously, the younger patients have better prognosis, as you can see here, but still the in-hospital outcome of older patients is not so dramatic. So I think age is not a contraindication for postcardiotomy echo, as you can see here. What about the configuration? So what kind of ECMO to use? What kind of ECMO mode? Well, in our study, we showed that peripheral cannulation versus central cannulation is certainly better in terms of in-hospital survival for postcardiotomy ECMO. So if you have to decide central versus peripheral, I would suggest to go for peripheral. And this is also highlighted by a recent editorial showing that the centrally cannulated patient postcardiotomy ECMO accounted for the majority of acute neurological events. Another configuration that we are pushing very much is the use of a pulmonary artery cannulation because this configuration helps the management of ECMO, particularly in postcardiotomy. And you can even use percutaneous cannulation and reach the pulmonary artery with a double lumen cannula, with a, here in the uh, left the figure, or with a single lumen cannula on the right figure. And you can use a, a oxygenation in the circuit, and this will have a so-called oxy -ervat because you are putting, you're providing a right ventricular support with an oxygenation, which is a VBA plus right ventricular assistance. But if you remove the oxygenation, then you will have only right ventricular support. So you can play with this configuration quite nicely. And this is important in many uh, different settings. For instance, if you used to use the percutaneous approach, you can see putting the cannula in the pulmonary artery from the jugular vein. The, the tricky passage is the right ventricular apex. But if you go slowly along the apex, and once you pass this tricky point, then the cannula goes in the pulmonary artery very easily. And then it remains safely 
and firmly in the pulmonary artery without any risk of dislodgement. As I said, it's very important in some particular setting, like post LVAD, you know that 10 to 20% of these patients develop uh, right ventricular failure after LVAD implantation, and the mortality in these patients is very high for right ventricular failure. And there are limited options. So the use of pulmonary artery cannulation, as you can see here, even percutaneously, uh, 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 it broadens a lot the options to treat these very complicated patients. What about the timing? As I showed you from Fuchs and colleagues, you have to implant the ECMO as quick as possible. You don't have to wait until lactates are going high because otherwise you will have a bad prognosis. Just to give you an idea, sometimes our even preoperative ECMO implantation is critical. Watkins and colleagues, they look at the only 12 patients, but very significant service because all patients were in cardiogenic shock and organ failure with STS mortality risk of 24%, as you can see, even higher than 50% of risk of mortality. But they implant the ECMO to improve the organ perfusion and the clinical situation and then operate the patient. And you can see that pre-ECMO and post-ECMO condition for all the parameters, they improved all tremendously. And so the patient improved before surgery. And once operated, you can see that in-hospital mortality and 30-day mortality was zero. So a, a meaning that once you improve the preoperative patient condition, the post-operative mortality can be really favorable. Another important message this is the same from Kapoor and colleagues, and they saw that if you spend very few, uh, few uh, let's say, in this case, um, hours, or let's say the time is limited between the diagnosis of right ventricular failure and echo implantation, this is really favorable. In, uh, in, instead, if you wait too long to Im implant the echo, once the diagnosis is made, then you will have more uh, non-survivors. And this is a very nice uh, statement from Jonathan Half. So if you have to consider temporary mechanical CV support for post-cardiotomy, you have to act very quickly, I would say immediately, and don't come late to the party, as, as uh, Jonathan Half states. So do not wait too much time. LV unloading is another very controversial issue in, in, echo, in venal arterial echo, but also in post-cardiotomy. This is quite a busy figure just to show all the modalities you have to unload the left ventricle directly or indirectly, percutaneously or non-percutaneously, surgical or non-surgical. But we made a extensive review to look at the modalities of left ventricle unloading, and we saw that almost uh, uh, the most common ways were transaortic, so the impella, just to make an example, or the IBP, or left atrium with very less or just a few or limited uh, uh, percentage from left ventricular apex or pulmonary artery. But I think you have to take care of something that this is the, a patient with the ECMO and intraortic balloon pump. You can see why the intraortic balloon pump works. The aortic valve is opening as you can see clearly from this video. So the aortic valve and ECMO and intraortic balloon pump makes the aortic valve opening. But look if we stop the intraortic balloon pump while on ECMO. No opening of the aortic valve. You can see no opening at all while with the balloon pump the aortic valve opens. So the intraortic balloon pump while on ECMO is really useful for this in this respect. And this was confirmed by Chen and colleagues who showed that if you implant the balloon pump with ECMO as shown in the lower uh, row the survival is much, much better. Although these uh, results, unfortunately, are not, have not been confirmed by all the uh, studies looking at this kind of uh, uh, issue. But what I want to show you is that you have a lot of parameters, but particularly arterial blood pressure, pulse fertility, and aortic valve opening. And of course, you have also, by echo, all this uh, uh, left ventricular distension, left atrial distension, smoke-like effect. So, but the, what you have to do is to always implant from the very beginning the so-called non-invasive LV unloading maneuvers, which are reduced ECMO flow, vasodilators, and so forth. But once you have these parameters, 
deteriorating, then for sure the intraarticular pump is needed. As you can see, reduce pulsatility, reduce artificial opening. But if this process deteriorates even further, like this, with almost pulseless uh, 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 arterial line or no opening of the aortic valve, then if you have also the IBP and this doesn't work, then you have to go to catheter or device base like uh, Impella or something like that. To, final, to finish my presentation, long-term outcome post-cardiotomy. This was uh, pre presented by Biancari and colleagues, and you can see that once the patients are discharged, so the high mortality is, of course, in the hospital, but once the patients are discharged, the long-term mortality, the survival is rather favorable, and of course, is related to the patient age, as you can see. So the younger the patient, the better is the long-term prognosis, but still, all the patients almost remain uh, alive at long-term at five years of uh, post-operative outcome. So just to summarize the key points, timing is very critical in postcardiotomy. I would say that this patient should be implanted in the OR. The prophylactic support can be also a very nice uh, situation, which you think that the patient is going to crash in the ICU, better to implant the ECMO uh, timely. And if you can also have a differentiation between right or left ventricular dysfunction, you can also use the right ventricular support only. First of all, you have to avoid bleeding. So protamine after surgery and heparin support for at least 12 or even 48 hours. So maniac hemostasis, closed sternum if you use central ECMO, although we suggest to use peripheral ECMO. So peripheral ECMO and left ventricular loading, in our opinion, with the ABP, but if you can use Impella, even better. You have to avoid extra filling. In this patient, a lot of fluids are given, but you can go into vasoplegia, so this is also another enemy. And finally, if it's possible, the ECMO should last less than seven, 10 days, and uh, pass to more advanced therapies like uh, LVAD or transplantation if needed and feasible. So I suggest you to go to this uh, uh, recent expert consensus uh, uh, the work done with the uh, task force of four society, ESTS, ELSO, STS, and AATS. This has been published last year in uh, uh, four journals, and uh, you will find all this information I gave you uh, in these papers. So in conclusion, I think that it's clear that ECMO, postcardiotomy ECMO use is increasing. But unfortunately, we are using ECMO in more and more complex and older patients. So this means that we are facing more challenging situation. Strategy, the configuration and timing is essential. I think that also LV unloading is apparently beneficial in my hours, uh, hence uh, EABP or even Impella should be used. I think we have new cannulas, new options, new modes, particularly tailored to the patient needs like a right ventricular support, isolated right ventricular support with a, with a percutaneous cannula. And finally, I think now we have some recommendations uh, thanks to the task force of four societies, and uh, this will uh, help for future investigation and also future recommendation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Lorasso, for an elegant talk. Are there any questions for Dr. Lorasso? Thank you, Dr. Lorasso, for a wonderful talk. I have a question for you. You mentioned a uh, lot of bleeding with central cannulation in post-cardiotomy shock ECMO. I would like to ask you, given a choice for post-cardiotomy LV failure, what would be your take on central VA ECMO with open chest meticulous packing and meticulous bleeding management in ICU? Or you would prefer to close the chest and put a peripheral VA ECMO? Thank you for the question. Yes, I think that, uh, of course, if you have the cannula already in place, a lot of surgeons will continue with the central ECMO without putting peripheral ECMO, which can have some uh, complications like uh, limb ischemia. But then, if you choose to go on with the central ECMO, you must close the sternum. You must. And this is possible because with central ECMO, you can unload the both right and left ventricle quite easily, so much easier 
more easily than the peripheral ECMO. So I would say central ECMO, if you decide to proceed with central ECMO because you don't want to change the cannula and you want to unload completely, okay, do it, but close the sternum. This is, I think, a must. And, and you should pass the cannula above the jugulum, not the sphoid level, because the cannula will pass over the heart and once you will start winning the ECMO, the, the heart will start uh, in, blowing and, and the cannula will compress the right ventricle. So again, central ECMO, closed sternum and cannula above the jugulum coming out from the chest. In my opinion, I will go better to peripheral cannulation, closing the sternum and uh, of course, perfusing the distal limb. But uh, because I think the central ECMO it, it unloads very well the right ventricle, but in my point of view, is much worse for the left ventricle. But this is a very personal opinion, and this was never proved. But the studies we did, and the study from other colleagues, international studies, they proved that peripheral ECMO is, has better prognosis than central, and mostly due to the higher blade rate of bleeding. So bleeding is really a problem with central echo. One more question. For a case of post cardiotomy shock, in a case of RV failure, do you prefer to put prophylactically a graft in the PA so as to manage post-operative uh, failure of the RV in case through that you can cannulate and put a RVET? Do you have any experience yeah, that's with that? Yes, we have. Uh, we usually do not like very much to put the prosthesis on the pulmonary artery. Most of the time, the pulmonary artery is very fragile, but this is a possibility. So you put the prosthesis on the pulmonary artery, and you can then uh, remove the cannula without reopening the sternum. But what I is my message is, if you have an isolated right ventricular failure after surgery, go for right ventricular support only. Do not go to VA ECMO, to vena arteria. You can support the right ventricle cannulating the pulmonary artery either percutaneously or directly or with a, a prosthesis. But go on right ventricle support only. That's much better for the patient. Thank you. I enjoyed your talk, Dr. Lourdes. A couple of questions. You said you uh, established some aggressive uh, anticoagulation and breeding protocols which help reduce your bleeding risk. Can you just elaborate on the points as to uh, how do you manage bleeding or prevent bleeding when you desire to go on ECMO for these patients? Yeah, thank you for the question. As I said, for me, bleeding in postcardiotomy ECMO is the worst enemy because you saw that in many papers, postcardiotomy ECMO patients are reopened for bleeding up to 50, 70 percent of the time. But bleeding is not only a problem of reopening and therefore infection. It's a fact that if you have a bleeding patient, volumes are really uh, unstable, and this means very unstable ECMO support. So bleeding must be fought, must be really struggled. And uh, in my point of view, what we changed is we put, we gave protamine at the end of surgery, even if we are going on ECMO. We do not give heparin until the bleeding rate is really nil, and then we start peppering. And this means usually we start uh, after 24 hours or even 48 hours, so one or two days after surgery. But until we do not see uh, the bleeding stopped, we do not start peppering. And this made a lot of change and a better prognosis for sure. So protamine, heparin less ECMO until the bleeding stopped. Thank you, Dr. Lorazzo. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, and have a great uh, meeting. Thank you.